Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is January the 30th, 2022. We are coming to the end of the first month of the year. And it's becoming increasingly clear that one of the big stories of 2022 is something out here in Silicon Valley we are calling Web3 and the crypto revolution. And uh, for a Sunday show, I decided to invite two of my uh, best friends, people who know a lot about crypto and Web3 or as much as you can know about Web3 because it's still very abstract. It's still what we out here call a work in progress. Um uh, my uh, imagination was caught by a wonderful article uh, earlier uh, this month by my old friend uh, Christopher Schroeder. He's been on the show before. He's a sometime author, investor. Uh, he's the co-founder of Next Billion Ventures, and he has an interesting piece which he published on LinkedIn. He has, I think, 800,000 followers on LinkedIn. He's one of the top guys on LinkedIn. Crypto Web 3 and the global unleashing. He's ambivalent about the unleashing, but he thinks it's for real. And Chris is joining us. Uh, Chris, welcome. Thank you for spending some of your Sunday on Keen On. Um, Crypto Web 3 and the global unleashing. What were you trying to articulate in this very compelling piece? It's a short piece, a a must read on, um, on, on LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn, and you can follow me on Substack also, which is where I I also publish it. One, it's just great to be with you, Andrew, as always. I end up learning much more from you in these discussions than anything I could share because you're way too generous in me. I'm I'm an explorer and one trying to understand the dynamics as a veteran of certainly Web 2 and probably the last days of Web 1. um, I'm fascinated by not only the dynamics of what's happening in Web 3 technologically, but the human behavioral aspect of it, like why people... Are gravitating to it and moving to it and at what breadth and at what depth and also why so many in web 2 who've been through this are trying to put web 3 down or trying to ignore it or dismiss it in many ways what came before them uh, dismissed them but what made me particularly unpack this because i've been really looking at this for a, a lot of different lenses i do a lot of investment in emerging markets and when you think about these rising markets who in the last several years have just really just gone explosive in the quantity of quality entrepreneurs who are building amazing entrepreneurs, an ecosystem of tech savviness, an ecosystem of building things that were not there has been something I've watched very closely. But on top of that, there's something broader going on, I think accelerated by COVID, which is a lot of people are looking around and they're looking at their backyards and they're looking at their governments and whatever. And they're saying, you know, a lot isn't delivering the goods. That, you know, I expect that education could get better. I expect healthcare could get better. I expect that I should be able to move money without value. I expect now, particularly with Web2 approaches, I should be part of financial inclusion. But the fact of the matter is millions of people are not getting those services. So they're asking themselves very basic behavioral questions, not high tech FOMO stuff alone, but they're asking themselves, how can we do better? How can we solve things in ways that the top down institutions aren't doing? I have been thinking over the last year or so that most of this is still very early days. And it's, you know, a little bit, a lot of people will criticize that Web3 and crypto in particular, which is not the same thing as Web3, that that a lot of folks are out there thinking about crypto and it's a way for very wealthy people to move money out of bad governments or it's a way for bad actors to do different things. And people dismiss it on those terms all the time. But lo and behold, I've been digging into this particularly in Africa and the democratization of the use both of crypto and of stable coins, which we have to think about in two ways, has blown me away. It's happened without me seeing it, which is, in a way, the last observation I'd make here. There's something, and this is different, I think, than Web2 in a way. There's an entire ecosystem of innovation, talent, and funding that is rising rapidly and at scale that's really just not the part of what's happening right now. And they're changing the games, one, because they want to. They're changing the game because now that they can, and they want something better. And that behavioral element to me is much more interesting than the technology alone. Uh, Let me invite him, my old friend Keith Tier. He and I do the That Was The Week uh, broadcast every week. Um, Keith is also um, the CEO of a new company uh, called uh, SignalRank. You can find it, signalrank.co. 
Keith, you and I have talked a lot about Web3 on That Was The Week. Do you agree with Chris that something real is happening here, but it's different from the, the Web 1020 narrative? Very different. I mean, I would, I would, you know, if those of we, everyone's probably familiar with how technology and governance disconnect all the time. You remember when drones first came out and people were flying their drones all over the place and there were no regulations preventing it. And some of them went near airports and stuff. And then, you know, quickly it had to make rules governing drones, which are still fairly primitive, even several years later. So government and technology are not in sync. And when it comes to Web3, um, you're talking about a global technology where a single government is somewhat you know, restricted in its ability to do anything. It, uh, and, and in Web3, capital uh, and tech come together separate from governance. Uh, and governance ends up being in the technology. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, Chris was say saying. That, about, say that again, Keith, because I think that's a really important point that a lot of people miss. Well, well, government yeah. being in the technology, it's going to mystify people, but I think it's a core idea. Yeah, well, well, the, the most promising parts of, of uh, and I'm going to use the label Web3, I agree with Chris, it's not entirely accurate for all the things we're talking about, but let's just use it for now. In Web3, in web uh, the most promising developments uh, build rules, either into smart contracts, which is kind of a primitive form of that, or into something called DAOs, uh, distributed autonomous organizations, which is a more sophisticated version of, of, of um, smart contracts. And um, stakeholders get to vote on change. Um, and the, the assumption of change is built into the tech stack. And the rules governing how that change can happen are published ahead of time prior to you joining uh, an effort. Um, so it's all transparent. You know, you know what the software is intending to do. You know your role within it. Um, rewards are allocated according to what you put in. Um, and and you know, when if I come up with a project, capital flows to me insofar as people like the project. A little bit like you know when you see those flocks of birds taking off to fly south for the winter, and they all seem to act in unison. Well, imagine that's capital moving around the world on Web three. Um, to projects that people want to fund. And you're talking about $2 trillion worth of value that can now flow with, outside of any governance. Let's, uh, let's bring uh, Chris back in. Uh, Chris, uh, Keith uh, brought up the issue of, of politics. Uh, you're also a, a Washington, D.C. guy. You, you've spent some of the early part of your life in government. Your piece seems to suggest, and this was one of the reasons I found it so intriguing, is the old system doesn't work anymore. The old top-down political system in particular, you quote uh, a, a couple of activists in this space and suggest that one of the aspects of Web3 is replacing or trying to replace the old top-down political system. Is that fair? Or am I putting words into your mouth? Well, it's a little bit fair. I, I think what I'd say is it could replace or it could be additive. In many respects, uh, the top-down remains important and could do a lot of things to make life very complicated and difficult for people. But on the other hand, very smart and innovative people in the public sector are leaning deeply into this. The mayor of Miami in the United States is an example of this. The mayor of New York recently has just been talking about it. A lot of rising countries like El Salvador have been leaning into it. And so, but is that for real? When I when you we when don't know I read about El Salvador and crypto, my uh, admittedly highly natural skeptical instincts perk up. Uh, is, is are some of these experiments just marketing campaigns, or are they for real? Oh, I think like everything in life, there's always an element of marketing, and there's also always an element that something's happening that I have to participate in. And, you know, frankly, I admire anyone who's willing to at least try the latter. I mean, let's, to to something that was very interesting that Keith said overall is that governments may or may not be able to control this. I think the jury is out and there are different elements of control. There's certainly the command and control control. And we've seen China has been very candid and blunt about what they think about crypto uh, going forward. India has bills now that they're looking to be able to really try to limit it. Pakistan is examining it, may go one way or the other. Um, uh, other governments that really could benefit from different elements of this are really trying to say, do we lean in 
and engage? Or do we really say we got to stop and control this? Which then adds the other element, which I really am beginning to unpack much more clearly now, which is governments who aren't stepping in, quote unquote, to control it by blocking it, but by trying to step in by sort of making it irrelevant. And that's why the conversation of stable coins are so interesting. So I'll give you a concrete example. So, so, but, but very briefly, Keith, uh, sorry, Chris, what is a stable coin? Because not everyone watching this will understand. Everyone still thinks in traditional financial terms. Well, in a way, it's, it's a stable coin is, is the closest to that because it's effectively government created fiat currency, but they are in fact dollars in the case of China, who are the first to really roll them out. It's quote unquote a digital yuan, and it allows yuan, and it allows you to be able to move value and money as simply and easily as any other crypto experience, but with a cons uh, currency that is not based on decentralization and the algorithm programming, which is uh, things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many, many others. It is still part of effectively a digitization of existing currency. And so in the case in Africa, what is interesting is there's no question people are, are speculating and investing in Bitcoin, Ethereum. They look at it as store of value like gold. But when it comes to transactions, what they really want is to get dollars. And up until now, they simply could never get dollars. And the reason why they want dollars is, one, their currency is unbelievably unstable in and of itself. And secondly, it's very hard to move to parents or friends in other countries or to get it from parents and friends of other countries or to actually build goods. I mean, startups in Africa now, literally, if they want to be able to just sign up for AWS, have to figure out how to get dollars. And nobody often wants their currency. Now, all of a sudden, they can get digital dollars. They can get effectively uh, uh, stablecoin dollars, and they're able now to transact with a lot less friction and much lower cost. Keith, uh, you, Keith I, let, let me just, uh, Keith, yeah. you and I have talked a lot on That Was the Week about Africa. Your, your wife is from Africa. You spent some time there. Do you see Africa as the natural uh, testing ground, the place where Web3 can become really meaningful? Do you agree with Chris? Well, Africa is definitely part of it, part of it. Um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say Africa is is um, likely to become a leader yet. Um, eventually, Africa will become a world leader. There'll be two billion people in Africa. Well, that's like the old joke about the Brazilian economy, Keith. Eventually, everything happens. Eventually, as as. Kane said we die is that for real eventually what year are you thinking no no but you know by by 2050 nigeria will have um close to 700 million population and africa as a whole will be approaching um a one and a half billion heading to two pretty rapidly and will be young and there'll be a middle class bit, way bigger than today's middle class uh, and and all of that is in you know research and and uh, stuff that we'd all agree with if, if if we had time to go through it. So uh, Africa's rising. There's no question about that. Um, it leapfrogs. I mean, if you look at the mobile networks and the satellite TV distribution systems in Africa, they're ahead of the U.S. The banking systems are ahead of the U.S. So so our, Africa is um, one of those countries that's leapfrogging by adopting recent technology as the first thing it does. So Africa's really important. It's growing fast. The Venture capital being raised and deployed there is growing rapidly as well. Uh, it's really important. But I think Web3 is even bigger than Africa. Web3 is the whole world. And it starts with developers um, choosing to spend their time writing code for it as opposed to writing code for, for anything else. And, you know, within the developer community, there's really three types of people. There's the people who work for big companies to earn a salary. There's the people who work for last generation startups on stock options. And then there's the pioneers working on what's coming next, paying themselves next to nothing but building it. Th those people, that's a growing number of people. Right. And those pioneers, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, those pioneers. I want to ask uh, Chris. Uh, Chris, you spent quite a lot of time thinking about Web3 and your really interesting piece. You quote a couple of women, Dina Sharif, Falgu Shah, both two young female investors, activists, entrepreneurs. When I asked Keith uh, on the That Was The Week, I said, give me an example of someone who somehow captures the spirit of um, Web3. And, and, and he, he uh, mentioned Vitalik Buterin, um, uh, who was the co-founder of Ethereum. 
Are there individuals who, for you, capture Web3, ideally, and perhaps companies? Keith also mentioned DAOs. I mean, we've obviously talked about crypto. Uh, back in the early days of Web2, Keith and I have had this argument before. I've always thought of Google as the quintessential and pioneering Web2 company. I don't think he agrees. But uh, is there an equivalent for Web3? Oh, I think that something Keith said before is is unbelievably profound and in some way in a distinguishing factor of what's happening now. And by the way, you're the first person to ever tell say that anything Keith said is unbelievably profound. So you, <laughs> you get a well, special Sunday morning award for that. Eventually. You know? This is a little bit like your question about Nigeria. Eventually everything will happen at some point yeah. in, a, in a universe. But but in any event, I, I don't believe that's true. But anyhow, what he said was is absolutely true. This is such a widely and highly distributed uh, event. This is a thing which is moving so quickly and and talent is driving to it. I was talking to a friend of mine quite senior at Sequoia, the Global Venture Capital Fund, but particularly known in um, in uh, California and the United States. He told me in the last six months, literally a third of every deal he's seeing now from the very bright young people that Keith described is Web3 in some form, whether from the visual aspect of it right. or the transactional part uh, of it. I'm just putting up on screen a New York Times piece saying, how venture capitalist uh, Sequoia, of course, being a classic example, thinks crypto will reshape commerce and indeed the world. Go on, Chris. Because it, because I think if in its application at its behavioral essence, if I can buy things easier than before, cheaper than ever before, I mean, more and more people now are literally stopping to going to e-commerce sites and transacting on Instagram. If I now can find a trusted environment, if I can find a place where I know my transaction is safe, I know it will be delivered. I know I can protect the IP of anything I build. Why would I not? do it. And so there's no question that Brian Armstrong at Coinbase and, you know, Elon in his own way has been a voice leading this that people follow. There will always be, by the nature of humanity, celebrities that will be looking at. Yeah, and Brian Armstrong was just comes. in the news because I think he spent 120 or $125 million on a new house in Los Angeles. So these people are, uh, he's the CEO of Coinbase. These people are splashing their money around. We don't need to talk about Elon Musk. Everyone knows what he's up to. Sorry, well, I mean, on. whatever whatever people do with their wealth, the more interesting thing is twofold. One, there is wealth at massive scale. Secondly, that they are becoming models that people are looking to. But third, again, Keith's point, we shouldn't be, we, it is our nature to find celebrities, but this story is going to be one about distribution. This is going to be one about the next Brian Armstrong coming from Pakistan, the next Brian Armstrong coming from Jakarta, the next Brian Armstrong coming from Dallas. It's it's going to be a very distributed but Chris, story. Chris, if the next Brian Armstrong does indeed come from Dallas or Jakarta or Pakistan, there's still are they going to be worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars? Are they going to be buying up real estate in Karachi or Manila? What's different about this? The real question, I know uh, Tim O'Reilly had a really interesting piece. He was one of the the fathers intellectually of Web 2.0. He had a piece, why it's too early to get excited about Web 3. And there's a lot of debate within Silicon Valley about whether this is really different, whether this really will be a, a winner-take-all economy or, or whether something structurally will shift within Web 3. You know, it's, it's very typical, I think, particularly in the media world, to say it's all or nothing, right? And I think the answer is going to be very nuanced. It will take more time. I mentor a lot of young you know, people who are in this now who, you know, you can tell that they're like toked up, they're wired. I'm going to miss it all. It's FOMO, you know, fear of missing out and that kind of stuff. And, and in a way that is similar. I mean, there's a wonderful quote I put in the piece that, that technological revolutions are usually overestimated in the short run and underestimated in the long run. And so I think there's always this this, this yin and yang about that was a Clark, uh, 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 an Arthur C. Clarke uh, quote, wasn't it? I, well, no, actually, it's accredited to him, but it wasn't him. It was somebody else, and it, it's been used. By and that's people. always the case with these famous quotes. Oh, yeah. But the but the bottom line is is that ne things need not be all things on one side or on the other. The north star to me is human behavior. Are you making people's lives better, easier, faster, cheaper, more beautiful, more engaged, safer? And are you doing it in a way that takes friction from their lives? These capabilities are doing that. They're also inventing things that are imaginative, particularly in human experience and in the virtual worlds, worlds of you know, what is typically thought of as meta outside of the crypto and payment side of it. But to embed payments and the ability of it in every kind of interactive experience we have completely trusted in a way that could not be easier at increasingly lower cost, to ignore that at a human behavioral perspective, I think it's caught up with the technology and not on where things may go over time. I don't have crystal balls on it, but I think it is something that one has to really focus on in that way. 
I thought you did have a crystal ball, Chris, and you, Keith. That's why I got you on the show. Uh, I've got, you, I've got, got about as much. A, you've got as good a crystal ball as anyone, Keith. My sense <laughs> is you're slightly more ambivalent than Chris about Web three. Is it more of the same? Is it more talk of democratization and more multi billionaires, more of a winner take all economy? What I don't understand is even with DAOs and all these other newly, you know, these radically restructured companies. Why it would be any different from Web 2? Why are you not going to have just a handful of winners? We had that with Web 1. We had it with Web 2. What's really different about this? Well, I, to be honest, Andrew, I think focusing on uh, the people that will make the most money is probably blinds us to what's going on here. Fair I, point. I think it's uh, inevitably there will be people that will make money. But actually, that that's what is the same as long as you've got capitalism that's going to be true right however um something else is happening underneath the surface um i think of it a bit like you know the the person who first thought up the flushable toilet before there was plumbing in order for the flushable toilet to happen the plumbing had to be built and you had to modernize the the, the cities mm -hmm. and the towns well we're at the stage of web three where we all know the end game. I mean, the end game is money is free, moves around the world seamlessly. At what no do you mean cost. money is free? What does that mean? Um, well, m money as a commodity c costs you. Today, you're going to pay the bank to have a bank account. So what I mean is um, having wealth of value in your, in your, let's call it a wallet, and being able to move it around and do whatever you want to it will be able to be done at zero cost to you. And, and, and um, you know, that's the end game. And, and you'll be able to do whatever you want with it, invest, buy stuff or whatever. Uh, by the way, ultimately, I don't, I personally believe the end game does not involve fiat currency. I think it involves stores of value and means of exchange that are produced by networks, not by governments. Uh, and so the end, the end and that's game. that's a pretty is, radical idea, one that sort of fits into your, Hegelian Marxist. Well, background. well, I, what I mean is, stable coins, instead of being the way to get an off ramp into fiat, will become a thing in themselves, um, uh, not required. Which is a very Marxist idea, a thing in itself, Keith. It will be a thing in itself. Now that said, today, where are we? <clears throat> we're we're kind of like the you know the head of Florence before the formation of Italy. Um, we have all these nation states. We have all these banks. We have all these national rules, they all try to slow down the emergence of things that undermine their authority or their command. And so we're in, we're in the early days of a transformation where the old is trying to kill the new. Or at and, least that, the and that's the core of, of um, and that's why I wanted both of you on the show. That's the core, really, I think, of Chris's um, Substack and, and LinkedIn piece, Crypto Web 3 and the Global Unleashing. Um, Chris, uh, Keith, as a Yorkshireman, of course, introduced the toilet and the flushable <laughs> toilet and the need for, um, uh, you know, infrastructure. There's a lot underneath that flushable toilet. Would you agree? Are we in the infrastructure plumbing stage? Is it, how, and how long is it going to take and what needs to be built before we actually get the toilets? I mean, look, a couple of observations of what Keith was saying. I mean, one is, I actually agree with him. I mean, at some point, I think the act of moving money is, is constantly the, uh, uh, is going to go down significantly and it may very well go to zero. And that means other services around it will come to bear. I will remind everyone that in Web 2, the saying early on was content wants to be free. And uh, there's no question that lower cost and the democratization of content has blown up and challenged uh, much of the traditional content, both making and business model dramatically. And but you at the same knew that on the front line, you were CEO of, I think, one of the first big internet, Web 1.0, uh, Newsweek Online. So you, you, you were on the front lines of that. Yeah, and we saw it. Yet I will acknowledge that now all the, the Web 2.5 2 uh, media competitors, I mean, you know, the ones that have won have been the big platforms. And we're still talking about the New York Times and the Washington Post and Wall Street Journal. I mean, the ones that came to, they were going to kill them themselves are mostly all gone right now. And so I think, again, we have to, we have to be sort of circumspect about how people behave, what human behavior wants to accept. And that's why I keep coming back to the human behavior perspective, because yes, at one level, it's about infrastructure, but it isn't about infrastructure. It is about an expectation and an ability for people to have less friction in their life in a trustworthy way when they've become 
less trustworthy of the traditional institutions that are no longer delivering the goods. And that to me is the really kind of significant part of this, whether it's it's some combination of various crypto or things we haven't seen yet, whether stable coins will be a part of, we don't know. We can rest assured that governments will want to lean in here hard. And a lot of traditional financial institutions will either try to embrace it or also try to crush it because that pattern is consistent through innovation. The really interesting question is by the nature of this technology and the distributed aspects of it that Keith described so well, can they? And time is going to have to tell. We don't know. But from a demand perspective, uh, this thing is uh, very, very intriguing and interesting, unlike anything I've seen in a long time. Chris, you and I had a lot of discussions over the last 25 years about the about both the bright and the dark side of Web 2.0. Um, I warned that if you did away with the middlemen, you would create informational anarchy, the death of truth. I think most people would agree that's actually happened. Are you saying in Web 3 that potentially we do away with government? And isn't the dark side, the downside of that, perpetual civil war? Aren't we back in Hobbes' state of nature? Potentially? The very things which make this so appealing to so many people is also very much as to why populism has risen both left and right around the world. People are dissatisfied with business as usual. They're one click away, can see the way the rest of the world is living. They look at their day-to-day -day lives. They know their problems. They say the people are not delivering the goods that we expected. And not only not delivering the goods, but very often it feels like a rigged game. But that can manifest itself in very, very different ways. I mean, remember, China came massively in Web 2, came massively out of poverty, and now 800 million people do yeah, not that use cash. That wasn't because of Web 2. I mean, let that's me, a parallel let me, let me, development. No, let me, uh, you're wrong, because 800 million people in that country now have financial access and access to credit who never would have possibly dreamed of it 10 years ago, and that was because of their access to Alipay and WeChat Pay. WeChat Pay and things like that. But we, by the way, which had nothing to do with Web3 and everything to do with a fundamental need that allow people to grow their businesses. I see every day people use, I mean, I think WhatsApp is asleep at the switch because I see people every day around the world use WhatsApp as an incredible tour of commerce. Why? Because it allows them to do things they could not do before, to reach customers they never could reach before in trusted and verifiable ways. Web3 is going to be a component of that offering different things. To your point about what does it mean for governments, under no circumstances do I believe anytime soon it is the end of government in any way, or that's necessarily the right thing, despite performance issues, which frankly, they should take responsibility when they need to, to improve them. But remember, if you and I were sitting right now with Orville and Wilbur on that beach, you know, with a flying bicycle, effectively, these guys might have dreamed about the possibilities of, of people flying everywhere, anywhere in the world in less than 12 hours. They probably weren't thinking that their invention was going to bomb Dresden or fly into the World Trade Center. Technology, however it comes, unleashes also elements of human behavior, not only in need, but also in who we are and the different kind of demands. Bad things will happen. Bad things have already happened from crypto now, but bad things happen in cash. So that's not the focus. The focus is, I think, in the fundamental needs. Can this technology address or not address them? And then we will have conversations about the darker aspects that will assuredly be part of it in parallel. Keith, you and I have had lots of conversations both on and off the air about libertarianism. I think you're more of a libertarian than I am, which isn't saying much. Is there a dark side to Web3 in terms of undermining the crumbling edifice, the legitimacy crisis of early 21st century governments, particularly democratic governments? Are you worried about how web the, the dark side of Web 3 could be even worse than the dark side of Web 2? You know, what, I think my worry about the dark side is all to do with existing uh, global systems built around nation states. Look at what's happening on the borders of Ukraine right now. Um, which isn't uncoincidental with, with what's happening in, in, uh, in tech and, and the conversations we're having today, I think. Yeah, but they're driven by um, the, the old structures drive conflict. Web3 has the possibility, not of ending government, actually, but of transforming the meaning of government. There will be government. It just won't be nation states standing up against each other that we see today. And I agree with Chris. Even that is not happening anytime soon. But if you ever want it to happen, if you ever want a world that's more like a Star Trek um, you know, deck where people from every nation speaking every language are all part of the same thing, Web3 
represents the window of opportunity through which we all have to drive to create the infrastructure that would make that possible, where we're human beings, citizens of the world, all equal in terms of what we can and can't do. That future can't happen unless technology transforms into a global infrastructure, putting us all on the same level playing field. And that's what Web3 promises. And it's a real promise, but it isn't real yet. And it's up to us to invest in things and make it happen. So interesting. It almost encourages me to, to write a book about Web3. If I do, I will credit the two of you. Chris, you've been doing a lot of reading. Um, you had a wonderful piece. Uh, again, you're a Substack, a LinkedIn piece. The best books read in 20, that you read in 2021. You've been on the show before talking about your wonderful book, Startup Rising. One of the books on your list was Clara and the Sun, uh, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's, what I thought was a rather dark vision of um, of an AI future. Um, we haven't talked about AI before. Is Ishiguro right, Chris, to warn us of the dangers of AI, of the dehumanizing quality of it? And how does AI fit into Web3? Well, first of all, I should just say that uh, Ishiguro is just a beautiful writer, and I pretty much would pick up anything that he wrote. But, um, you know, two observations, Andrew, for what it's worth. I mean, one, I find too often science fiction in the last decade or more has become very dystopian. Like, it's a lot about the exploration of things that can go wrong, which I think is probably a little bit of a reflection of where we are, uh, both individually and how we're viewing society. This is well before COVID. And I think there's not enough exploration of what can be unleashed. Having said that, nor is there great conversation about the seriousness of the ramifications, both positive and negative, because there are even positive ramifications. If through AI and the healthcare ramifications of that, we all start living to 150, a wonderful thing, it builds a thousand questions about what that actually means to the economy, to society. Are we 150 at 90 or 150 at 60? I mean, it just opens up many questions. And one of the things that concerns me more than the discussions in and of itself, uh, in the technology in and of itself, is a lack of a forum where we can do it. It struck me no end that in the last presidential debate, and I will now bet anybody here at dinner, in the next presidential debate, AI will come up not at all. It's one of the most unbelievable shifting things under the covers. I bet you that because I, I want to buy you dinner anyway. I owe you okay, dinner, Chris, I'll so. do it. But the fact of the matter is we're not having serious conversation about it. It's not attainable yet. It's already becoming embedded in aspects of our lives. It's already helping us in many ways in healthcare and beyond. And it's going to open up big, big questions. And you need to be able to have discussions to have them. And, you know, there is some of it going on, which is interesting, but it's not part of the broader dynamic. A book like that can reach people and have them come to the conclusion it's purely dystopian. Or they can ask them, to me, one of the most important questions about AI, which is what does it mean to be human? What do we want from it for ourselves? How do we want to interact with it? What things can we give up to make our lives better, easier, faster, more beautiful, safer than they are before? And what things do we want to gravitate to because they are the greater opportunity of what we do in the work with our families, the way we travel and so on. And a book like that, I think at least helps that conversation uh, go along. I certainly read it in that light. Uh, one of the things I like about your commitment to reading, your, uh, you, you, you write a lot about new books, um, both old books, new books, books coming out is that you're a, a new media entrepreneur. You've been in this web internet thing since the beginning. You're one of the first uh, entrepreneurs, and the book has survived. Um, why do you think books, for you at least, this remain so important in, in an increasingly digital world? A lot of people wrote off books, and of course they were all wrong, especially during COVID. The publishing industry has done rather well. I don't know. I think the jury may even still be out. There are a lot of very young people I meet who don't read books but re are fanatical readers. I was talking to a young woman uh, the other day who, who consciously decided to spend a year focused mostly on media and social media as a way to really understand technology. And I can empathize with that. I think very often when a technology book is written, it's, it's overtaken by events the day it is published. And as you know, the publishing industry still will take a year or longer sometimes to publish books, which is absurd. But at the same time, there is a depth and an arc in a storytelling in a book, which I still admire greatly and really helps, helps me to think about the world in a different and much more in-depth way. It's not just the serendipity of me moving across different apps and things that I go to to garner information or to even have conversations on WhatsApp, which is my number one way of finding and sharing information uh, and signal and elsewhere. 
but it allows me to go on the arc of a story of depth that only great writers can do. And so it's not about one chapter or, or something small, but it's something that larger. And in the, when it's at its best, Andrew, every book to me, I feel like I'm living another life. And so to me, that is a very powerful thing that I don't think will change. Keith, you were one of the first investor in TechCrunch. You've been around new media as well. Was there a book, uh, 2021, that really you enjoyed, that captured your imagination? Like, uh, I mean, Chris has a long list, but I picked out Clara and the Sun. He also, uh, he had a number of other people uh, who we've had on the show. Evan Elsnos, for example, uh, who I know is a good friend of Chris. His book, Wildland, The Making of American Fury, is also really interesting. So my, my, my favorite book of 2021 was written in 1939, and it's called For Us the Living. And it's a science fiction work. I'm blanking on the author. Someone look it up while I'm speaking. But it's a well-known science fiction author. And this was an unpublished book that was discovered. And it, it said... What's it called again? I'll look it up. For Us the Living. And the book is the story of universal basic income set in, uh, in, in 2039. So the book, the book takes place, uh, uh, someone dies in a motor accident in 1939. So for us, the what? Living. Um, uh, uh, wakes up in 2039 and is rescued by a beautiful woman who takes him to her cabin where she gets something called a heritage check every month and has a flat screen on the wall and performs dances on a Friday so people can donate um, parts of their heritage check to her for her performance. So it's basically Zoom meets uh, NFTs meets crypto, uh, but written in 1939. And in a Actually, world... you're wrong. And according to Wikipedia, it was written in 1938, and it was oh. by uh, Robert A. Heinlein. That's it. Sorry, but I got it. I got it a year wrong. That's not bad for a for a guess. Very good. But oh, that's a great that... book. It's it, if you want to understand Web three, it's amazing. You can read something written in 1938 and it actually throws light on things. <laughs> that's a, that's a fan. I just ordered it by the way. What a fantastic! Now a little bit on the less UBI side of it. I must confess, I'm rereading Atlas Shrugged right now, and that's a, that's the other side of the of the conversation, but I've just ordered that book. It sounds fantastic. So thank you, Keith. Well, I want to thank both of you. Both of you are wonderful guests, uh, Keith Tier and uh, Chris Duffer Schroeder, both excellent understanders of or trying to understand Web3. Uh, I think we're going to get to it. We'll be back with more Sunday shows about tech. I think it's an, a lovely uh, morning to try everything. Keep well, guys, and we'll have you back on the show in the not-too-distant future. Bye. Bye-bye. Andrew may be gone, but Keith, I'll find you. All right. This yeah. is a tree. The tree yeah, to be yeah. with you. We're still live, by the way, according to my screen. Well, I'm going to leave then because Andrew left. All right, <laughs> but I'll bye. find you from Andrew. Thank yeah, you again. Yeah. Great to listen to you. You too. Bye. Bye.